Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, there is a sheet you may have picked up on the way in. Resurrection, fact or fiction, history or hoax. Unfortunately, between me and the printer, uh, they played a, g a game again with the numbering. I don't quite understand what's going on, but uh, that's supposed to be numbers one to six under resurrection fiction and one to three under resurrection facts. But well, I don't know how many of you have seen the Mel Gibson film, The Passion of the Christ. I remember seeing it in an extremely crowded cinema in Manila. There were people sitting on the, in the aisles, on the stairs. You could hardly even get to the allocated seats. And they watched it in complete silence. And uh, it's the portrayal, for those who have seen it, of the last few hours that Jesus spent on the earth. And as you probably know, it shows how he died in quite graphic and gory detail. However, the resurrection of Christ, three days later, is given hardly any coverage. As far as I remember, it was just one image that lasted, I think, just a few seconds at the very end of the film. And then the credits rolled up the screen. And so one needs to ask, is the resurrection just an add-on to the gospel and maybe the bigger question we need to ask this morning is did it really happen at all well let's read and it's on the screen for you here from the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15 which is the great resurrection chapter uh, and it sort of acts as a bit like a, a sort of a early church creed I suppose uh, from verses 3 to 8 for what I received, this is Paul writing, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So here, Paul is listing uh, those who Christ appeared to. Um, first of all, Peter, the apostle, and then to all the 12 disciples, and then to more than 500 at one time. So obviously there was a big gathering, and, and Christ appeared, and they all saw him. Um, and then James, and then to all the apostles, and then last of all he says to me. Well, of course, for the Apostle Paul, that was sometime later than, I guess, the rest of the disciples. It was on the road to Damascus where he met with Christ. He heard his voice, had a conversation, and a light shone. So there's a, a number of people uh, who Christ appeared to. Now we're going to read again from that chapter. I haven't got it on the screen because it's... Uh, it's too big for the screen. But if you've got your Bible open at 1 Corinthians 15, we're now going to pick it up at verse 12. And as I read this through, can you just, I want you to notice something. Can you notice the number of times the word raised or resurrection is used? Just in these few verses. So this is 1 Corinthians 15. We'll pick it up from verse 12. And we'll go through to verse 22. And just notice in the midst of everything else. The repetition here. Repetition's always there for a reason. But if it is preached that Christ, this is verse 12, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are more to be pitied than all men. But 
Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Did you notice how many times? Well, if I counted it right, ten times the word raised appears there and three times the word resurrection. So Paul repeatedly states that Jesus was raised from the dead, although it's clear from that first verse, verse 12, that there are some who didn't believe that. And he then goes on to explain the implications of not believing in the resurrection, which are actually very, very serious. There's a whole list there. We haven't got time to go through it, but, but do read what it means if the resurrection didn't take place, that preaching is useless, your faith is in vain, <coughs> we're more to be pitied than all men. But it also raises the question, did the resurrection really happen? Did Christ physically die and after three days come back from the dead? If so, then it's something that no one else has done before or since. Does it really matter anyway? Couldn't this just be a sort of a, a very nice uh, fairy tale? It's been handed down, a very sad story, but it has a happy ending. Somebody dies, but somebody rises from the dead. And there are a number, you're probably aware of, sadly sometimes even Christian leaders who have cast doubt on the literal physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some time ago there was an Anglican bishop called David Jenkins. He was the Bishop of Durham and uh, he described the resurrection uh, as a conjuring trick, a magic trick with bones. In fact he cast doubts also on the, the incarnation. Of course if it is just a tale, a story that's evolved, then Christians have clearly been sadly deceived because they all claim that the resurrection actually happened and that the resurrection of Christ is an event in space and time. Now that's important because what we're talking about here is not just a, an issue of Christian doctrine or Christian belief. It's more than that. At the heart we're talking about a historical event. Did that or did that not happen 2,000 approximate years ago? And if you can disprove the resurrection, then it's like a pack of cards, everything falls. The Bible's untrue, Jesus is a liar, uh, probably suffering from some form of serious mental delusion, and the whole Christian faith crumbles, and the whole thing is a hoax and a lie, and we're living under a sort of delusion, even just being here today. One writer has written, Christianity stands or falls with the resurrection. Disprove this and you can throw out the whole faith. So we do need to be sure whether this happened, especially since Jesus himself repeatedly said he would die. He prophesied. I counted up in Matthew's Gospel, was it six different times where he said in advance that he was going to Jerusalem, that he would die and he would rise again. So with so much depending on the truth of this matter, uh, you probably won't be surprised to learn that over the years many conspiracy theories, many weird and wonderful explanations have arisen which seek to disprove the resurrection. And what has been very interesting is some of the very people who've been most committed to trying to disprove the resurrection have themselves come to some very surprising and very unexpected conclusions. So what I want to do this morning is just have a look at some of the evidence, so-called evidence, that people have gathered to support their view that the resurrection never happened. And these theories, I'll warn you now, range from the interesting to the downright wacky. And then after that, we'll look at some resurrection facts. So let's have a look, first of all, at resurrection fiction. And our first theory is the swoon theory. You see, some have suggested that actually Christ didn't physically die at all. This is how the thinking goes. You see, he was taken down from the cross, um, but he just fainted or he'd, he'd fallen into a coma. Uh, 
Then, when he was placed in the cold, stone-cold tomb, he revived sufficiently to make his way out and then deceive the disciples into thinking that he'd come back from the dead. That's the uh, known as the swoon theory. A swoon is a word for sort of a faint, sort of going into unconsciousness, really, for a period of time. You could even describe it as a near-death experience, maybe. Um, some have even claimed that Jesus pretended to be dead using drugs supplied by Dr. Luke, but he was somehow later resuscitated by one of his followers. I warned you, some of these are crazy. Others have suggested a group of supporters who were members of a secret society that Jesus was also a member of, went to the tomb dressed in white, heard Jesus groaning inside, scared the guards away and rescued their friend. Now, these are all sort of variations on this what's called swoon theory, but was that feasible? Could that have happened? What does the Bible say? Well, as the crucifixion took place on a Friday, the next day was the special day, it was the Sabbath. And John tells us that because the Jews didn't want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus uh, and then those of the other man. But when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs, but instead what John records as happening is that one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced the side of Jesus and that resulted in a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, had Jesus been still alive, the piercing of his body, of his side, would have resulted immediately in strong sort of spouts of, of blood coming out. But medically we know that the separation of blood and water was a result of massive clotting. That's a physical phenomenon that always happens uh, after death. And it, in fact, it's a sign of death, the separation of blood and water. So here's fairly clear medical proof. And a stone cold tomb, I, I wouldn't really look upon that much as a sort of a intensive care unit, an ICU. Um, I would have thought contact with that would have killed him rather than reviving him. And yet it somehow, at the same time, in the following 36 hours, according to this theory, Jesus came out of a coma, and like a sort of, I don't know, first century escapologist, manages to wriggle out of a shroud. Do you remember he'd been wound tightly with, I think it was two pieces of cloth, all of which had been layered with sticky spices, which uh, John says weighed 34 kilograms. Now, if I remember rightly, that's the maximum size weight of a suitcase you're allowed to take in an airport. 34 kilograms. So, somehow, I mean, that's more likely to suffocate somebody, isn't it? Anyway, uh, he, according to this theory, managed to wriggle out of it. Um, despite being in a greatly weakened state, he did this supposedly single-handed and then wow he managed to move the massive rock at the entrance breaking in the process the governor's seal that Pilate had said had to be put on this on this tomb he then somehow overpowered all the Roman soldiers on guard and made his way into the city presumably naked and then by the time he met the disciples he made a rapid and astonishing recovery proclaiming he had conquered death and broken through into a new dimension of radiant life. He then appeared and disappeared over 40 days. We have six independent witnesses recording 11 separate appearances. But if he didn't die then, when did he die? And what happened to the body? I mean, apart from every other difficulty this fairy tale raises, it means, think about it, that after living a life without sin, the one who knew no sin was now deliberately deceiving his own disciples and everybody else. Doesn't fit, does it? As is often the case, you need much more faith to believe these far-fetched theories than to believe the facts. Secondly, we have the claim that the disciples stole the body while the guards were asleep. But again, how would they have done that? 
The stone was very large. It was large enough to prevent wild beasts or, or, or people or thieves coming. And the Bible clearly tells us that the chief priests and the Pharisees came together to Pilate to prevent exactly that happening. In Matthew it says that they came and they said to Pilate, this is the chief priests and Pharisees, Sir, we remember that while he was alive, the de deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Not interesting, by the way. The scribes and the Pharisees remember that. The disciples seem to have forgotten it, but they noted it. So they said, Pilate, can you give the order for the tomb to be made secure? Otherwise, the disciples might come and steal the body, and then they'll go around telling everybody he's been raised from the dead. And that last deception will be even worse than the first one. So Pilate said, OK, take a guard, go, make the tomb as secure as you can. And so they went. They made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. So this was pretty well protected, wasn't it? The guards were representatives of the emperor. The tomb, the tomb was sealed with a royal seal. Now, for a guard to fall asleep on duty was an extremely serious offence. The punishment for quitting your post or for falling asleep while on duty was death. So the stakes were very high. And for all of them to have all fallen asleep at the same time, oh, come on, that's unlikely in the extreme. However, supposing the disciples had managed by some means to steal the body, now they'd be facing a sort of a, an ethical, moral dilemma. Because they were going to then preach later the resurrection. But they'd be lying, wouldn't they? Because they would have stolen the body, so they'd be breaking the ninth commandment. You shouldn't bear false witness. And then how could they possibly later endure the suffering and even the deaths that they did meet if all this was based on a lie. Doesn't make sense. What about number three? The hallucination theory. Hallucination. This is the theory there are certain types of people that are a bit psychotic or neurotic and they're susceptible to seeing things that are not real. They're only figments of the imagination. I mean, Hallucinations do happen to the individual, but 500 people at the same time all suffering a hallucination. That seems very unlikely. Then there's another theory. This was the case of wishful thinking theory. In other words, they so desperately wanted Jesus back, they treated their imagination as if it were reality and Jesus had returned. I mean, you still come across this sort of thing today, don't you? There are countless people who still speak of seeing Elvis Presley alive, even though he died in 1977. You can visit the Elvis Sighting Bulletin Board, which has its own website, which claims to keep visitors aware of the movements of King Elvis, so people should not be surprised when he pops up in your local supermarket or is seen swimming in the neighbour's swimming pool. Well, actually, since there are an estimated 85,000 Elvis impersonators in the world, that is not as unlikely as it might seem. I read a statistic, what was it? One in every, see, one in every 30,000 in America is an Elvis impersonator. But the resurrection of Jesus is an entirely different matter, not least because his followers did not expect him to come back to life. So wishful thinking theory is full of holes. Another attempt that fails is another attempt. It's called the poor lighting theory. <laughs> the idea that in the early morning, Peter and John and all the women went to the wrong tomb. And none of them realised it. Or would you prefer the grave robbers theory? The belief was that the body was stolen by the Romans or the Jews. But why would they want the body? And in any case... As soon as the disciples preached the resurrection, all the thieves had to do was to say, it's not true, here's the body. It's just another false 
doctrine. Indeed, all these and several other ingenious and clumsy attempts just cut across the strong biblical evidence for the resurrection. So let's move from fiction to facts, from speculation to specification, if there's such a word. Resurrection facts. I just want to highlight three of the many results that we see regarding the resurrection. The first one is the early church preached it, uh, lived it, and if I could also say died for it. If you look at Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, it's wholly and entirely founded on the resurrection. If you remove the resurrection from Peter's sermon, uh, I think there'd be virtually no doctrine left at all. And when you read the Acts of the Apostles, you find the resurrection is its principal theme. If you get some time, uh, uh, something that I've, I've done a number of times, sit down and just read through the whole of the Acts of the Apostles in one go. It's, it's, it's more exciting than any novel you could read. It's more encouraging, it's more thrilling, it's more amazing. And one of the things you'll notice, 28 chapters takes you, I don't know, hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours. One of the things you'll notice is how they preach the resurrection. This is what they preach. Yes, they preach Christ died, but they preached and he was raised from the dead. It's the principal theme, really. So the death of Jesus is indispensable to salvation, but it's also the precursor to his rising again. Now, I'm sorry, this is rather small, but... Um, here are just some verses from just a few chapters of the Acts, the uh, book of the Acts that I've, I've written down. Um, first of all, from this message that Peter preached after the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, but God raised him from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That's chapter 2, verse 24. Go on a few verses, the same preaching. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of the fact it was the resurrection that seemed to be the emphasis in their preaching after the healing of the blind, of the beggar you remember a crowd gathered and rather than talk about the healing miracle they just use it as an opportunity to preach the gospel and uh, in that event he says you killed the author of life but God raised him from the dead you can't have just the death without the resurrection that's an incomplete gospel when you talk about Jesus dying you haven't told the whole story you've left out the, the best bit in one way Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you Christ crucified verse chapter 4 verse 10 but whom God raised from the dead. This is uh, Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, after they the healing and they were in prison, they came out of prison and uh, this is what they said, God raised him from the dead. Chapter 4 verse 33, this is after their release from overnight in prison, they go back to the disciples and it says, verse chapter 4 verse 33, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace was upon them all. You can't escape it, can you? It's, it's the resurrection. It's, he was raised from the dead. And therefore, he's alive today. And then chapter 5, verse 30. Again, before the Sanhedrin, Peter and the other disciples. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you'd killed by hanging him on a tree. They wouldn't be preaching this message if it was all just a joke or a, a made-up story. This was a reality that they'd experienced. They'd seen him, it impacted their lives, and they preached it. And it gave them, I think, added boldness and courage. And then when you consider how the disciples died, it wasn't just how they lived, it's how they died. Do you know that all of them died a martyr's death, except two? Here, if you're interested, is a list of how the disciples died. As far as we know from church history probably there's some tradition thrown in but this is the list that's come down to us Andrew was crucified on a St Andrew's cross in a Greek colony Bartholomew 
was flayed alive or beaten to death in Armenia. James, that's James the son of Alphaeus, was crucified in Egypt. The other James, that was one of the sons of Zebedee, we know from Acts chapter 12, he was killed with a sword at Jerusalem by Herod and he was one of the first to die. John, his brother, was the only one of all the original disciples who died of natural causes in extreme old age. But uh, it's interesting, he died exiled on an island called Patmos because he'd been exiled there for being a Christian. Judas, well, he died a violent death but had his own hand. He went out and hanged himself. Matthew was slain uh, by the sword in Ethiopia, so he got down to that part of Africa with the gospel. Peter, according to tradition, was crucified upside down during the reign of Nero, the emperor of Rome, who for a short period instituted some very vicious persecution against Christians. Philip was hanged against a pillar in Greece. Simon was crucified. Thaddeus was shot to death with arrows in what today is Iran. And finally, Thomas. Well, Thomas was run through with a lance near Madras, the east coast of India. I guess probably a straight line from here, go across the Indian country and you'd come to on the east coast there, Madras or Chennai as it's known today. So this is how they died. They all died in this way for the gospel because they were preaching that he had died and was raised from the dead. And I often think that the emphasis then is perhaps somewhat different from the emphasis today when his resurrection is only mentioned as a sort of a, a corollary almost like as an afterthought if you can prove that Jesus never rose from the dead or if at the very least you can raise serious questions about it we have as I said have all been well and truly deceived and the whole church through all ages has been living a lie that's how critical the matter of the resurrection is. It's not an optional extra. It is not an add-on. And I want you to notice something that I noticed. It doesn't say Jesus rose from the dead. I think maybe it says that once or twice. Overwhelmingly, it says he was raised, passive. God raised him from the dead. The power of God came the Trinity together, and he was raised from the dead. Power of God. There's also external recognition of Jesus, and I don't know if this quote has already been used in other apologetic lectures, but this is from the great uh, Flavius Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, and, and this is what he writes. Um, this is from the Antiquities of the Jews, if you're interested, book 18, section 3, chapter 3, translated by Whiston in 1737. This is what he says. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as teach the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold, these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And Josephus adds, and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day so that's how we're described as the tribe of Christians who are not extinct two quotes one from John Copley I think you have these on your handout who was one of the greatest legal minds in British history he said evidence such as that for the resurrection of Jesus Christ has never broken down yet and Westcott professor at Cambridge says there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Christ. So, not only did the early church preach it and live it and die for it, there is no gospel without it. 
If Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. I think the challenge here is to let's watch the gospel we preach. Where does your gospel leave Jesus? Dead or alive? Fred Cozin has been a frequent, I think over the years, uh, speaker, great, great Bible teacher from the US and uh, He's very strong on this. If he hears somebody talking about the death of Jesus without mentioning the resurrection, he'll go up to them, whether they're a speaker up front or whether they are just doing some personal evangelism. He says that's not the complete gospel. It's not just Jesus died. He was raised from the dead. Remember, that's part of the story. It's not a, a dead Christ. Many countries you go to, you would think Jesus is still dead. All you see is the crucifix with his pale body hanging on it cross is empty he's raised from the dead and he's alive today of course different groups have at times made various claims about the resurrection of Jesus Christ to suit their own pet theories and doctrines Mormons for instance believe quite incredibly that Jesus Christ appeared on the American continent after his resurrection and planted the gospel there in AD 34 despite the fact that the gospels the book of Acts, the epistle, epistles, and the whole of Orthodox church history knows absolutely nothing about that. We, however, are given a very serious warning of what awaits those who add anything to this book. Muslims say it was not even Jesus who died on the cross. Christ ascended, but there's no death, no resurrection of Jesus Christ. Spiritualists believe in the resurrection, but that Jesus is just a ghost like other spirits floating around somewhere. According to Paul, heart belief in the resurrection is the great test to find if someone is a true Christian because he said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, you can't escape the resurrection in the gospel. It's got to be as integral, really, as the death of Christ. So it's not an option on extra. How do you explain today the fact that Sunday by Sunday, in most parts of the world, the church will meet? It's a commemoration of the day of resurrection every Sunday. One man who attempted to disprove the resurrection was an English barrister and unbeliever called Frank Morrison. He decided to write a book to disprove the resurrection and ended up proving it and in the process became a believer and he wrote a book about it called who moved the stone you can still buy that book today jesus said because i live you will live also that's the promise of the resurrection for you and for me one more quote ff bruce said if jesus had not risen from the dead we would probably have never heard of him. That's how important it is. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So in other words, despite the cross, without the resurrection, you're still an unforgiven sinner. Because it takes us to the heart of the gospel. Resurrection has removed the sting of death. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And finally, this message is for the world. The resurrected Saviour declared to the disciples, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. So how, how did the Father send the Son? Because Jesus said to the disciples, and he says to us, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you in the same way. Well, the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. So that's an all-embracing, inclusive message to take to the nations. The missionary dimension is escapable in the resurrection because it was after that he commissioned them in that unique and special way. And so here we have a message to be taken to the world. And as we come up to Christmas, we're reminded of the incarnation, the message there is for the world. I bring you good news of great joy that will be 
for all people. So for us, the message is that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, died on the cross for us at Calvary, and was raised to life again three days later. So as we sail to Sri Lanka, we can say with complete confidence and assurance, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was raised on the third day also according to the scriptures. Yes, the resurrection did happen. Jesus is alive today. And therefore the words of the song are quite correct, which says, so I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful gospel you've given us in its totality, the good news. But God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Thank you for changing our lives. Thank you for forgiving us our sins. Thank you that through your death and your resurrection, death no longer has a sting. We ask, Lord, you'd help us when we share this gospel to remind people of the truth, that Jesus is not dead, he's not hanging on the cross now, he's alive today to change lives. For your glory we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.